Good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, I know that I'm the closing speaker, so normally there's beer waiting for you. I heard there's no beer today, um, so you will have to endure me. Um, I'm working for Singularity University, which is a kind of a unique place. We're based in um, Silicon Valley on the NASA Ames campus, and all our, our focus is to explore what's happening in technology and teach this to um, leaders all around the world. Um, the thing you pl uh, probably don't tweet today is I'm going to give you the $10,000 education which you would get from us normally uh, in about 20 minutes. So with that being said, um, it, this is going to be the hitchhiker's guide to what we call exponential technologies, and I'm framing this for you so you understand what we're actually talking about. So there's something interesting happening in the world which is exponential trends. Um, and this is a classic example of an exponential trend. This is population growth. So we were, as a human species, able to populate this planet effectively through technological breakthroughs. So agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, information revolution. And we are on this um, very steeply accelerated um, exponential curve. So just keep this in mind how these curves look like. There's an interesting piece to this, which is when you map these curves out and you compare them to what is called linear curves, there's, um, two interesting pieces in this curve which happen as a crossover point, and we explore this in a minute. But the important thing to know about linear thinking is you are hardwired to think linearly, whereas a lot of the technology trends we're seeing today are exponential. So they are become very hard for us to actually even grok. And I give you an example, very simple example. Imagine you're taking 30 steps, and we're taking 30 linear steps, one step after the other. In metrics, I'm from Germany, so we use this uh, metric system. Um, that's about uh, 30 meters, and uh, in Imperial, it's somewhere in the 100 feet range. You have an idea how far this is. It's probably from me to the end of this room. Now imagine if you were to take 30 exponential steps. So every step is twice as far as the, the last one. I want to get your first number, which pops into your head. Don't try to do the math. Just tell me what the number is. How far do you get? Give me a guess. 250,000 miles, you are cheating. <laughs> the typical, no, no. So the typical response you get is, is very often um, something in the, in the range of like a mile. The more adventurous are telling you, well, it's from here to Europe. Um, in reality, it's 25 times around this planet. It's to the moon, back, and halfway to the moon again. That is what exponential deception is. You have, you're just not wired in your, uh, in your brain capacity to really understand what exponential means. So if we are going back to this curve, now remember, you are thinking linearly. A lot of technology is actually moving exponentially. There's um, effectively three interesting pieces in this curve. The first piece is where the linear trend is higher, is expected to be higher than what the exponential trend in reality is. And we're calling this the age of disappointment. And the best example I can give you is Google Glass. So nothing against Google. I work there. Um, I love these guys dearly. But the typical reaction to Google Glass you get from people is, you look like an idiot wearing it, the battery life is poor, the functionality isn't actually that great, and it's $1,500. So you expect it to be better than what it actually is, and you start to dismiss it. You're disappointed. This is a classic example of what happens with technology. Then something magic happens. Technology gets better and better, and you come to this crossover point, which we call the knee of the curve. And then you come to the age of amazement. This is when you can't even fathom the growth you're seeing in these product categories. Now, good entrepreneurs see this crossover point. And the classic example of the crossover point is when Steve Jobs, for the first time, went on stage and showed the world the iPhone. I was sitting uh, in Berlin in a room where we had a live stream of that conference. And next to me was a young um, software entrepreneur. And he literally said to me, this is the future. I'm going to build for this thing tomorrow. And he became one of the first entrepreneurs in Germany who built software for the iPhone. Really good entrepreneurs can anticipate this trend and can see these exponential trends. And this is anything and everything we're trying to do at Singularity University. So if you're not taking anything out of this, this class, this 20-minute course here, remember this exponential curve. Let me give you a couple of examples how this plays out in the real life. Um, this is data which was compiled by Eric Schmidt, um, chairman of Google. What he did was he um, uh, went to a research team and asked the research team, 
how much information did mankind produce until the year 2003? So if you take all the, the cave drawings, the works of Michelangelo, the, the music we composed, the works which are in the um, Library of Alexandria, and you were to digitize this, you get a number which is five exabytes. It's a one with 18 zeros. It's a very large number of data. The same amount of data in the year 2010 we produced in two days. All of mankind's data, two days. Three years later, we produced the same amount of data in 10 minutes. That is what exponential curves look like. Now, if you take this on the other side, on the cost side, let's take the cost of sequencing the full human genome. This was first done in 1999 at an expense of about 3 billion US dollars and took us seven years. Heroic effort of the Human Genome Project um, completed in, in, and um, open sourced. In 2006, we did the same thing for about $10 million in a couple of months. This summer, a company launched a product which uh, sequences the full human genome for $1,000 in a mere hour. There's people inside of Singularity University who will tell you that in, in about five to 10 years latest, you will sequence the human genome for a penny. So effectively, every time you flush the toilet, we will sequence your human genome because it's effectively become free. I give you another example, penetration of mobile phones, and this is the one we, you're probably most familiar with. It's still staggering to me. There's 7.1 billion people living on this planet. There's 7 billion mobile phone connections. So 7 billion mobile phone lines spread out across 3.45 billion people. Now, if you take the world's population and you subtract the people who are age zero to whenever you get your first cell phone, seven, probably, eight, 10, um, and you subtract the people who are very old, and you subtract the really poor out of like the bottom of the, the very bottom of the pyramid, we have 100% cell phone penetration on this planet. This is staggering. And granted, these cell phones are dumb phones, they're feature phones, but still. So, we're taking this a step further. We talked about this age of disappointment and the amazement. Um, Peter Diamandis has a framework which he calls the six Ds of disruption. And this is what happens when you look at exponential technology. You start out with the first D, which is it's deceptive. Because what you're seeing in the beginning is very slow growth. You see growth which is not even there. It doesn't even register. You're coming from one unit to two units to four units to eight units. It just doesn't even register for you. So it's deceptive. You're, dis you're basically dismissing it. When it hits this knee of the curve point, it becomes disruptive, massively disruptive in industries. Anything and everything which can be digitized will be digitized. And you know this better than anyone. But we're seeing this in industry after industry. Anything and everything which you can digitize will become digitized. Anything and everything which you can dematerialize will become de dematerialized. A very simple example is the digital camera. If you are in the business of making uh, point and shoot digital cameras, you're effectively out of business because obviously we're using cell phones these days. Another example for this is the torch, the flashlight. Nobody has a torch anymore because your phone has a little flashlight unit and even since iOS, I believe six, Apple built in a little, little function where I can just switch on the torch. So your, your business effectively became dematerialized. Then, once you have everything and anything digitized, it becomes demonetized. Money just gets out of the system. If I sequence the genome for one cent, US dollar cent, there's no money in the system anymore, at least not in this part of the value chain. And once there's no money anymore, it becomes democratized. You've got public access to it. So these are the six Ds of disruption. This is the stuff which happens when you come into a world where you see exponential trends. Now, let me take you through a little bit of a journey. And I'm calling this tomorrow today. I'm giving you a couple of examples of technologies which I see, or we are seeing, which are on this curve. They haven't yet reached, to a large extent, this kind of tipping over point, and just want to get you sensitized to this. And the examples I chose are hopefully irrelevant to you. Um, we have many, many more examples in like any and every field. Um, I chose uh, the digital ream for you. What's important to understand about tomorrow's technology is, and this is a, if you run a business, this is a really me important message. You can buy tomorrow's technology today. It's just expensive. 
This is not about inventing technology, being visionary, creating something which isn't there yet. You can buy any of and any, anything today. It's just expensive. So let's start with mobile on location. And we talked about this. I, I know that you talked about this quite a bit, so we rushed through this a little bit. Payments. Apple Pay uh, just launched um, in California. I, I used it um, the day it came out. It's fantastic. It's completely dematerializing my wallet, and it's dematerializing my credit card. So if you're in the credit card business, your business model has suddenly overnight changed. iBeacons, we talked about this earlier. These are iBeacons. You can buy them in China currently for $10. Once I have an iBeacon for $10, I can effectively just plaster them through my store because they're cheap. These things will, in two to three years, will be a dollar each. And then you just like throw them everywhere, because you can. Don't cost you anything anymore. This is a, an example of a, a German company I work with. They're using iBeacons for uh, heat mapping in physical stores. What's fascinating about these guys is they're actually mapping not only the, um, the, the customer flow, they're using this to, in real time, change physical displays. So they're literally calling their stores and say, hey, we're seeing customers moving more towards this left side. If they see this particular display, can you move this more prominently? They're also using the footage from their surveillance cameras to do mood detection. They look at your faces and detect in which mood you are in and change, for example, the music which plays in their stores automatically. So this is the stuff you can do once you have like ubiquitous sensors. This is the true revolution. This is a chip, which is the size, is roughly in metrics, is about two millimeters square. Um, this is a golf ball. This is a dimple in a golf ball. You see the size as in comparison. This chip is, comes from a company called Freescale. The, this is not only a CPU. It's a complete computer on a chip. And it has the compute power of an early stage Pentium. So if you bought a Pentium computer 10 to 15 years ago, like these really big things which you had to put underneath your desk and you could uh, warm your feet on, this is now the size of two millimeters. And you can buy it for 75 cents. So we are starting to call this smart dust. Because what you do with this stuff is, once it's 75 cents, I will make anything and everything which is electric smart, just because I can. And in a lot of cases, this might not make sense. The smart toaster is always the kind of like the joking example. But in many, many, many cases, it becomes really revolutionary. Think about like even light. If I make every single light bulb smart, so the light bulb sees if someone's in the room and can switch itself on and off. It can, it can sense how light the room is from ambient light and can dim itself so that I have um, consistent light. Billions of dollars in energy savings right there. So if you're an entrepreneur, if you're working on something which has an electric cable, I would think today, like I would literally go home and like take everything which has an electric cable and think about how would this look like if I would just put a computer in it? Because 75 cents later, you have. Let's go into the next stream, artificial intelligence. Um, you might remember this. I grew up, um, I was in high school when this came out. Um, this is Deep Blue. Uh, Deep Blue was the first smart computer uh, which beat um, Kasparov in chess. This happened in 1997, if I'm not mistaken. What's interesting about Deep Blue is Deep Blue's effort effectively was crunching a huge amount of data. So this is effectively dumb big data. So you take a huge amount of data, which is chess is very easy. You can just compute every single opportunity you have and go very deep into like the potential tree. And then you make a calculation, which is your best move. Um, Deep Blue won very narrowly against Kasparov. Um, so they had, in a match of six, they had three draws. And then the Deep Blue won two um, against one from Kasparov. Recently, this thing came out, Watson. I don't know if you saw this in Jeopardy. Watson is a computer from IBM which takes this whole concept further. And what Watson does is it does reasoning. So Jeopardy is hard for a computer because it's the inverse. You don't need to find the answer. You need to find the question. Deep Blue is, uh, sorry, uh, Watson. Watson has reasoning uh, capabilities. So Watson has effectively the capability to really understand the concept of the question. What's fascinating about Watson is two pieces. One is Watson destroyed the human component absolutely destroyed them in um, this uh, competition. And Watson is, Watson is like millions of dollars of hardware. So for a lot of people, it's out of reach. But IBM, talking about the notion of demonetization, IBM now offers you Watson as a service in a cloud 
compute, similar to what you do with an Amazon Web Service today. So we will see a lot of like very smart computers who will help us do reasoning, who understand human language conceptually, and then can basically make decisions and can, for example, guide to buying decisions um, or can uh, become real companions to us. Taking this out of the ream of the virtual into the ream of the reality, um, additive manufacturing, also called 3D printing. This is not my, my photo, but I saw this exact printer. This is the very first MakerBot. Um, it's probably 10 years old. Um, and I was in the room when um, uh, Brie Pattis introduced this. And here's the thing where the 6Ds tripped me up. I saw this thing, and what I could see was um, plywood and cardboard on the side so that it doesn't fall apart. I literally couldn't see the vision. Brie was talking about, oh my god, this is going to change the world. Additive manufacturing is going to take the world by storm. I couldn't see it because I couldn't see past the thing which was in front of me. Now, 3D printing is ubiquitous. You, use, you 3D print pretty much anything and everything these days. So if you fly an Airbus 380 today, 10% of the machine parts are 3D printed. If you go to a dentist in uh, Silicon Valley, if it's a good dentist, and you need to get a crown made, the old process was they took an imprint, they send it to the lab, it takes two weeks, terrible, like, it's just horrible. Today, they take a 3D scan of your tooth, repair the tooth, print it in porcelain, and put a tooth in um, after, the, uh, after they take it out. Whole procedure, two hours. You can print fashion. You can print guns, um, which is very controversial, obviously. And the thing you see on the, on the uh, right there is a cast. So you break your arm today, we scan your arm, we print a wickedly cool looking arm um, cast. It has a couple of interesting properties. The first one is you don't need to scratch yourself anymore with the ruler, um, if you ever had to do that. The other one, and you see these wires. Um, the wires kind of look trippy. But what the wires do is they apply an electric current to your arm, which uh, increases bone healing by 20%. So you literally print anything and everything. Now, printing might not be interesting to you because you're in a digital business, you think. But printing starts to disrupt the disruptors. This is Warby Parker. Um, they disrupted the market for glasses, very obviously. Perfect business model, amazing company, love them. But they're currently getting disrupted, or will be just getting disrupted if they don't change, by these guys. These guys come out of the Netherlands. They 3D print glasses. What they do is they have an app. You take a picture of your face. They print a pair of glasses which perfectly matches your face in, in a size, like the sizing and the... The fascinating thing is they even print their lenses. This is a one-piece print these days. So 3D printing is going to change a ton of consumer behavior. Like the notion of I go into a store and actually buy a thing, like a physical thing, and the store needs to keep that thing, will probably go away. We will just print this stuff. If you need a replacement part from Ford today, I uh, was born in Cologne, Germany, where Ford has a, a multi-million dollar storage facility for um, replacement parts for all their cars. They're currently tearing that down and put a big server and a couple of printers there. In the future, when you buy a Ford um, part, they print it, put it into a box, and ship it to you. So that's additive manufacturing. Let's talk about data science. And data science is the one you probably know most about, like big data, small data, all this kind of stuff. So let me just give you one example. Um, this is a video from um, a company called uh, Waze, which does traffic projections. What's fascinating about Waze is um, the moment they have about 5% of drivers in a city using Waze, they have a perfect, up to the minute, view on how the traffic works in the city. Now, why is this interesting? First of all, for you personally, it's interesting because it routes you around traffic um, incidents. If you take this a step further, I can guarantee you today that we will see in about 10 years, you will not be able to buy a car which is not autonomously driving, so self-driving. Um, when you come to um, Silicon Valley, Google is driving like hundreds of thousands of miles in their self-driving cars, and every large car manufacturer has their self-driving cars on the road in California already. Once you have that, and once you combine it with big data, you can suddenly optimize not the individual route, you optimize the whole city. So it's really fascinating what you can do with like, large amounts of data if you use them in the right way. This is the, the topic which I personally find most interesting in the digital world. We're calling it new realities. And it starts with um, avatars. So you might have seen something like this at an airport. Uh, you can rent this thing today for $250 a month. 
This is a, a hologram avatar. At airports, I've seen this in Asia at a couple of airports, they tell you that you need to take the liquids out of your, uh, out of your um, uh, packages. What's fascinating about this particular avatar is, and this is what we're calling convergence of technology, this avatar has speed recognition, image recognition, and reasoning. You can walk up to her, show her a screw, and say, I want to buy this screw if you're in a DIY market. She does image recognition on the screw, understands what you're actually talking about, and will starts redirecting you to the right aisle. So you will see this lady or someone like her in a bunch of uh, stores soon as meter greeters. This is what is convergence of technology. None of these technologies themselves are really new, but packaging them together and putting them up for $250 a month, that's new. Augmented reality. This is an early prototype of Google Glass. And what I personally find so fascinating about this prototype is from this to this took four years, not more than four years. And Google Glass, again, this might not be the, the perfect product yet. But now take Google Glass, the thing we, we talked about when I was at Google a lot about, like, what do you do with Google Glass? One day you just bake it into, a, into your glasses. So when you wear your glasses, it will be just in Google. It, you will just have functionality baked into your glasses. You don't need to wear this, like, weird headset anymore. And what you can do with this is this is an example of a uh, more advanced headset called um, uh, Meta, Meta One. What you can do with this is you overlay your field of vision with interesting stuff. You can use it for, for shopping, for example. So this is basically the view a user has. You can use it for um, your personal yoga class. The hologram, if you have watched um, Star Wars Episode uh, Two or Episode uh, Four, depending on how you count, um, Princess Leia, the hologram, is now reality. What's interesting about the Meta glasses is, if you want to buy them today, you can buy them for $667 in the developer version. The stuff is here, and it's cheap. So taking this a step further, so augmented reality is all about, I take your field of vision, and I put stuff into your field of vision. And those could be, imagine those could be like instructions, like um, directions, this could be information. I, um, we have a prototype in, uh, in our lab where I walk up to someone, and the, we do image recognition on your face, and then we show you information about the person based on their LinkedIn profile, for example. So I get information about who you are. This is virtual reality. So the idea of, like, I take you into a completely new reality. Um, this is the Oculus Rift. This thing you can buy, again, for $350. And what virtual reality does is it gives you a stereoscopic image, like a three-dimensional image, you have 210 degrees field of vision. So you basically see as far as like the human eye sees in terms of its field of vision. And it tracks your head movement. It knows where you're looking. So you're literally in the scene. And let me give you a couple of examples how this looks like. Um, this comes out of Holland, where they not only track, uh, so they track this person's position in space, uh, which is the reason why he's in this green room. So he's putting on these goggles. And this is now what he's going to see. So he is stepping into a completely new reality. And this is the field of view he has. He is literally in the room. There's nothing which, is, which keeps him from the reality anymore. So this is a new reality. If you take this further, um, this has been done by Topshop, which is a fashion retailer. Um, and they've done this in London. They've taken. A, a 3D camera rig, effectively a, a ball-shaped camera rig with 16 cameras, and put it onto a fashion show, and then allowed people to take the, the Oculus Rift and be at the fashion show virtually. And you're not just watching the fashion show. You are there. You can look into any which direction you want. You are right in the scene. Now, the interesting piece is, and this is probably the most important thing you, you want to look at, Look at the uh, expression on the faces of these people who are actually experiencing this. And this is why I'm so excited about this. You will see this in a second. Just look at her. Now I show you why I'm really excited about this. Um, so we have a whole bunch of those things in our lab. And I do a lot of lab tours where I get people like basically try it out for the first time. Um, this is not from our lab, but this scene, like this scene, plays out in our lab all the time. 
what you're seeing on the monitor is a, a roller coaster. The roller coaster works like this. You see a stereoscopic image, so you're like literally in on this roller coaster. You can look into any which direction. It goes up very slowly. Then you've got a very steep fall. It takes a few turns, and then you go onto a, a straight again, and then the roller coaster will like take off because it goes off a, off a ramp. Just look at what this um, what the experience of this gentleman is. The best piece comes last. So we are on the straight now. So he's kind of recovering. And we're flying. <laughs> so here's the reason why I find this so fascinating. Two pieces. The first one is, it never fails to impress. The first one is, you lose your sense of actual physical space in the room. You literally, when you do this roller coaster, and I've done this like so many times that I can't even begin to like tell you, but you lose your sense of like direction. You feel it in your stomach. It's a physical, visceral reaction. But the piece which excites me most, and I think this is why it's a complete and utter game changer. This is the first piece of technology which I've seen, and I'm doing technology since 25 years, which creates such a strong emotional reaction. There's a company in um, LA which uh, created a, um, a demo where they went into a bombed out house in Gaza, and they put one of these like 3D camera rigs into the house. And this, you, when you put on these goggles, you're effectively standing in the middle of the house. And you see basically the destroyed house, you see smoke coming up, you see people walking by. They've tried this out on, on a whole bunch of people. Nearly everyone cries. It's an incredible empathy driver. This is the first time I've seen technology be actually able to do this. So wrapping this all up, I've shown you a whole bunch of examples of technologies which are on this curve, somewhere on this curve, close to getting actually to the crossover point. We're seeing this in a whole bunch of different areas. And I don't want to go into the details because I only have 20 minutes. We're seeing it in artificial ro intelligence, robotics, nanotech. Biotech is super interesting. What's happening in synthetic biology is just staggering. Um, the, the simple way to think about this is think about the human genome effectively as a programming language. There's no difference. Your human genome is four letters. If you program, like computers run on bits and bytes, ones and zeros. Genomes run on four letters, GTACs. So kids today start thinking about the human genome or like genomes in itself like programming languages and they start to reprogram nature. Um, medicine and neuroscience, medicine is massive. The, the disruption we are seeing in medicine, especially coming from healing to preventing to actually enhancing is just staggering. Um, networks computing system is the obvious one and then energy and environmental system is probably the one we should pay most attention to if we want to keep this planet sane. So wrapping this up, there's this moment here, which is actually the ground is shifting. And you might know the Kodak moment. 1996, Kodak was a $28 billion company, 140,000 employees, was the leader in, in photography. Kodak invented the digital camera. That's the crazy thing. They invented it. They had, the camera had 0 0.5 megapixels. And the Kodak management team couldn't see the future. They said, who wants to have 0 0.5 megapixels, a blurry picture in a camera this size, literally this size, if they can have film? Film will always be better. In 2012, Kodak went bankrupt. By that time, there were only 17,000 employees. The same year, Facebook bought Instagram. 13 employees, $1 billion acquisition cost. That is what is called the Kodak moment. There's these little agile teams which leverage the future, which see the future, and they're disrupting massively industries. I actually believe we will see way more of these Kodak moments happening. I see, I, and I believe we'll see it in many, many more uh, industries. Take these guys. Like now we are actually disrupting the disruptors. Skype was bought for $8.5 billion by um, Microsoft in 2011. They have 100 million active users. Skype is by far the largest telecommunications company in the world, bar none. In 2014, WhatsApp was bought by Facebook. Um, closing price was actually $22 billion. They had 500 million users. 
at the time, and they're growing, still growing really, really strong. They already announced that the next thing they're doing is voice over IP. They will overnight turn into a company which is five times the size of Skype. They dwarf any and every telecommunications company on the planet. So we will see many, many more of those examples. And again, WhatsApp, 53 employees at the time. Let me close this with a statement from Alan Kay. Alan Kay was a uh, lead scientist at Xerox PARC. Xerox PARC, in a very short period of time, at the end of the 60s, um, roughly seven year period of time, invented pretty much anything and everything you use on your computer today. The graphical user interface, Ethernet, the laser printer, was all done by about 200 people in Palo Alto at Xerox PARC. And Alan Kay went out and said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. You cannot wait for the future to happen to you because the future will disrupt you and destroy your business. You need to be ahead of that curve. And the curve is there, and you are there. Thank you.